Hi there, and welcome to another Mickey's Roundtable adventure where we explore everything Disney, one themed adventure at a time. Yesterday, September 30th, 2024, I headed over to Magic Kingdom. It happened to be the 36th anniversary of my very first visit to Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World, September 30th, 1988. On that trip, I went and visited both the Liberty Square Riverboat and Tom Sawyer Island. At this year's D23 Expo out in California, they announced that a new Cars Land would be coming to Magic Kingdom. I love cars. Several days later, they announced that, well, it was gonna go right smack dab in the middle of where the Rivers of America, the Liberty Square Riverboat, and Tom Sawyer Island are. Okay, so I thought, you know what? I'll make a video remembering the Rivers of Huck, no. I started out at the Transportation and Ticket Center and then made my way across Seven Seas Lagoon to Magic Kingdom. That is a really cool way to go. You can see the castle from forever away. Uh, it's what they like to call a weenie. A weenie is something that draws you in. It draws you into the park or it draws you into the specific lands or attractions within the lands. As you enter the park, as you scan your ticket and head in under those railroad tracks, you don't see the castle anymore. You pass under the sign that says, here you leave today and enter a world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. You pass posters for attractions that are in the park. A story unfolds, much like a movie, the names and the windows above the storefronts up Main Street are like the opening credits to a movie. From the central plaza in front of the castle, also known as the hub, you enter the various lands, the various realms of Magic Kingdom. Tomorrowland, Fantasyland, Adventureland, and at Magic Kingdom, Liberty Square. Past this gateway stirs a new nation waiting to be born. The 13 separate colonies have banded together to declare their independence from the bonds of tyranny. Oh, whoa, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, that, was, that was the old plaque. I was reading the wrong thing. Uh, they must have changed it at some point. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm getting Animal Farm vibes here. But anyway, uh, the new plaque, beyond this gateway lies a humble village built on hope and courage. May all who step foot here be awakened by the same hope and courageous spirit. Liberty Square is the only land at Magic Kingdom that has a plaque like that, dedicating it, describing what the land is. It's also the only land at Magic Kingdom that was not previously at Disneyland. Now Disneyland, when Walt Disney dedicated it in 1955, he also had a separate dedication for each one of the lands. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Here age relives fond memories of the past. A few words of dedication for the happiest kingdom of them all, Fantasyland. Before our preview of Tomorrowland, I'd like to read these few words of dedication. A vista into a world of wondrous ideas, signifying man's achievement, a step into the future, Frontierland. It is here that we experience the story of our country's past. The color, romance, and drama of frontier America as it developed from wilderness trails to roads, riverboats, railroads, and civilization. A tribute to the faith, courage, and ingenuity of our hardy pioneers who blazed the trails and made this progress possible. Although Disneyland never had a Liberty Square, there were plans, there were ideas for a Liberty Street off of Main Street USA. Over here on my wall, I have a reproduction of, it was the first map available of Disneyland to the general public. What's cool about it is there are things missing on there that are now there in integral to Disneyland, Space Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Pirates of the Caribbean, the Matterhorn. But what's also cool is there are things on that map that were ideas that never came to be, including a Liberty Street off of Main Street USA that included a Hall of Presidents. The idea for Liberty Street at Disneyland evolved and was expanded and became Liberty Square at Magic Kingdom and did include that Hall of Presidents, 
which was an expansion of the Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln attraction there at Disneyland as well. Other attractions there in Liberty Square include the Haunted Mansion and the Liberty Square Riverboat. The Liberty Square Riverboat, the Liberty Bell, is one of, if not the most unique attractions in all of Walt Disney World. It's one of the longer attractions, longer rides that you can experience. It's about 20 minutes to go around the rivers of America, around Tom Sawyer Island. It's the only ride that I know of in all of Walt Disney World that actually leaves on a schedule. It leaves at the top of the hour and the half hour all day for its entire operating schedule. You'll note that I said ride, not attraction. So I'm not including shows like the Hall of Presidents or other uh, shows around Disney property. You can actually plan your day around it. You can say, hey, we've got a lightning lane at 1230. What are we gonna do until then? Hey, we'll jump on the riverboat at 12 o'clock. And uh, 20 minutes later we get off, we go up to Haunted Mansion and we can ride that ride. You can't really do that with any other ride. Oh, but you know, you wanted to get something to eat and you know, that's a priority. You do want to eat, but you know what? Uh, yeah, you can bring food onto the Liberty Bell Riverboat. There's a snack stand right across the way over by the Liberty Bell, you know, the Bell Bell. There's the Liberty Square Market. That's where they sell those turkey legs. There's a snack stand over by the Haunted Mansion and then quick service restaurant, Columbia Harbor House and Sleepy Hollow, a counter service restaurant. Grab some food, bring it on the boat and enjoy it while you travel the rivers of America. You cannot bring strollers on board. That's probably the only restriction there is. But if you've got a wheelchair or an ECV or a walker, you can bring those on board. Here you can do that. And it's not just one ECV at a time. The Liberty Square Riverboat, the Liberty Bell, you can bring on as many wheelchairs, ECVs, electric wheelchairs as you want, as you need. If there's two or three people in your group, you don't have to take turns. You don't have to decide who's gonna transfer, you know, draw straws. Okay, grandma, you gotta transfer. Grandpa's gonna ride in this ECV. Nope, everybody can drive on board and enjoy the ride the same. And as I've mentioned before, it's a 20 minute ride it's relaxing and scenic. You head on in through Frontierland, past Tiana's Bayou Adventure, previously Splash Mountain, right by Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. That's my second favorite part of the Liberty Square Riverboat ride. You go right by Big Thunder, right as the roller coaster comes whipping past you. My favorite part is if you get to see the steam train, if they line up, uh, they might play whistle tag for you. And that's really fun. There are tremendous views from the riverboat, all three decks, from the bottom deck all the way up to the top deck, referred to as the Texas deck, because uh, you can see as far as Texas from up there. I kind of liken it to the people mover, but only for Frontierland. There are also tremendous views of Tom Sawyer Island. Uh, don't get me started on how fantastic Tom Sawyer Island is. Oh, too late. Tom Sawyer Island, it's a walkthrough attraction, but it's unlike any other walkthrough attraction at Walt Disney World. Uh, you don't go in a single path that leads you from one thing to the next to the next, and then you get to the end. No, you can kind of go and wander wherever you want like taking the ferry boat across Seven Seas Lagoon to get to Magic Kingdom. You take a boat to get out there and it adds to the immersion of the experience. You take one of those Tom Shore Island rafts out there, only takes about five minutes, less than that once you get on board one of those rafts. Once you're out there, you can kind of wander to your heart's content. There's a cave, there's a mine, there's an old windmill you can walk through. There's Harper's Mill, an old fashioned grist mill, you know, powered by a water wheel. It's not working right now because, you know, of course, you know, they don't take care of anything. There's the Barrel Bridge. That was closed down for a while. They were refurbishing it, working on it. And it was actually kind of a surprise that it came back because the rumors had been floating around for a while that they were going to be closing down the island and the rivers of America. And uh, before they officially announced that they were going to be closing those, uh, the Barrel Bridge came back and 
I thought, oh yeah, good. Maybe, maybe those are all, they are just rumors. Sadly, they're not just rumors, uh, but the Barrel Bridge, that's a favorite. And it is, it's fun to be out there uh, and just kind of wander and explore on your own. But it's also cool to watch kids and families. They are out there and they are playing and laughing and possibly even learning. And there are great big smiles on their faces. Also out on the island is Aunt Polly's. Aunt Polly's used to be a restaurant. Uh, it's no longer a restaurant. They don't serve food there anymore. There's a couple of vending machines. Uh, one says sold out and the other one doesn't work. Like on the Liberty Square Riverboat on the Liberty Bell, you can bring food out. It's not as easy to get it out to the island. I brought a picnic lunch myself. Uh, brought a sandwich and some chips and, uh, and a soda. And you can sit down and you can enjoy that and watch as the riverboat goes by, cool views of the Haunted Mansion, really nice, really peaceful, and uh, you can just kind of relax a little bit. You're on vacation, right? So goes the theory. Tom Sawyer Island is actually two islands. There's the island that you land on when you take your raft across, and then the other island, you take Superstition Bridge, kind of like the Barrel Bridge. It's got some bumps to it. It's, it's kind of fun in and of itself. Out on the island is Fort Langhorn, Langhorn being Samuel Clemens' middle name. Clever, huh? Uh, inside the fort, there's rifle roosts, and you've got uh, pretend guns that you can shoot at Big Thunder Mountain across the way. Those are some cool views as well. There's a bathroom out there. That's important. Uh, there's also some animatronics. There's like a little blacksmith shop, and you can't necessarily see the guy's faces, but uh, the one tall guy whose back is to you, Apparently, uh, that's Abraham Lincoln. My very favorite part in all of Tom Sawyer Island is in the back of the fort, there's an escape tunnel. Like the other caves, tunnels on the island, it's like the cave and the mine on the other part of the island, except it's a little narrower and windier. You can get out of the fort through there. None of this, of course, came from nothing. They didn't say, oh, we got some empty space here in the back of the park, what should we do? Oh, we'll put in a river and uh, okay, yeah, that's good. No, there's a backstory here. Uh, you wanna hear it? Tough luck, I'm gonna tell you anyway. Walt Disney, of course, loved trains, steam trains, and I speculate just, you know, steam power of any kind. Back in the 1920s, he visited the Henry Ford Museum, Greenfield Village, and there they had both a steam train and they had a steamboat. If you look back at many of the early Walt Disney productions, Disney films, there's a lot of trains. But if you look back to the very first Mickey Mouse cartoon, uh, Steamboat Willie, it did feature a steamboat. So I think, I think there was probably an affinity for steamboats as well as steam trains. <laughs> Then when Walt decided that he wanted to start building an amusement park, a theme park, before Disneyland was Disneyland, before they looked at property in Anaheim, California, they were looking at a little bit of land just right next to the studios there in Burbank, California, and Walt was going to build what he called Mickey Mouse Park. The early concept art for Mickey Mouse Park featured a town square, an old western town, a steam train, and yes, a riverboat. So when Mickey Mouse Park evolved and became Disneyland, when that idea became fleshed out, it included a Rivers of America, a steamboat, the Mark Twain. A stern wheel riverboat, something most living Americans have never seen. Incidentally, Walt Disney and his wife Lily celebrated their 30th anniversary last Wednesday, right here at a special party aboard the Mark Twain. But right in the early 1960s, Walt Disney was planning a theme park, a theme area in St. Louis, Missouri called Riverfront Square. The land would have featured a riverboat ride. That project fell through, but Walt was always the dreamer, always moving forward, always moving ahead. This is where the early planning is taking place for our so-called uh, Disney World project. In fact, the heart of everything we'll be doing in Disney World will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. We call it Epcot. Included in the Epcot plans, I believe it was to satisfy investors, they included a, another theme park, 
a Disneyland clone which was to become Magic Kingdom. Today I want to share with you some of our ideas for Disney World. Now the prologue to this film told you some of the philosophy that made Disneyland in California what it is today. Of course there will be another amusement theme park in Florida similar to the one in California. When Walt Disney passed away in 1966, his brother Roy, who had been involved with the company from the very beginning, they were partners, but he had promised Walt on his deathbed that he would finish the Florida project, not the Epcot city of the future, but the first phase, Magic Kingdom. The name was changed from Disney World to Walt Disney World to specifically be named for Walt Disney himself. I hear it said that uh, Disneyland was Walt's park and Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom was Roy's park. Yeah, that's true, but Roy built it in honor of his brother, dedicated to his brother. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Walt Disney World is a tribute to the philosophy and the life of Walter Elias Disney. Here age relives fond memories of the past. And here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future. A magic kingdom where the young at heart of all ages can laugh and play and learn together. Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America. Four score and seven years ago. With the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. May Walt Disney World bring joy and inspiration and new knowledge to all who come to this happy place. Dedicated this 25th day of October, 1971. All the same Imagineers and executives that built Disneyland, they were involved with building Magic Kingdom. They all knew Walt and they honored him in how they designed the park and laid it out. They knew what he wanted. I've been told that the train station on Main Street USA at Magic Kingdom was the very last thing that Walt Disney ever officially approved and signed off on. I don't know if that's true for sure. It sounds pretty good. I do know that in the Keys to the Kingdom tour, if you take that at Magic Kingdom, they will tell you about the Liberty Tree that is there in Liberty Square and how Walt Disney personally picked out that tree for that land. The idea for Liberty Square, originally Liberty Street at Disneyland, the idea for the Hall of Presidents, they were Walt's. Proponents of destroying the rivers of America for the sake of a new cars area or whatever it's going to be will often cite Walt Disney, quote Walt Disney, Disneyland will always be in a state of becoming. They were always going to be changing, always going to be adding. Yeah, yeah, he said those kinds of things. Everything in this room may change time and time again as we move ahead. When opponents of destroying the rivers of America, like myself, start quoting Walt Disney, it's not so much about telling people this is what we think Walt Disney would do today as much as it is just trying to figure out what he did do and why he did the things that he did. Let me give you an example of something that Walt Disney and his immediate successors did at Disneyland that changed it for the better. At Disneyland, before you ever had Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, which was built after Walt Disney passed away, originally, that was a mule train ride. You'd ride on the back of a mule or in a stagecoach. That was upgraded. That was improved. It was plus. It became mine train through nature's wonderland. Then later on, it was changed again to Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. It maintained the same theme and the same underlying idea and concept that fit in with the land that it was already in. They changed it. They improved it. But they didn't fundamentally change the underlying idea of what was there and how it tied into the land and the park. Walt Disney touched upon this idea when talking about the Florida project, what would become Walt Disney World. But the basic philosophy of what we're planning for Disney World is going to remain very much as it is right now. Walt Disney Company CEO Michael Eisner 
was the first CEO to come from the outside. He did not come from within the company and he wanted to alleviate fears that he would come in and just change but, everything. Uh, I came here to try and continue what Walt Disney and his associates set in motion 50 years ago. And that is very simply this. It is essential to maintain the old, to respect the old, to uh, replenish the old, to enhance the old, to modernize the old. I'm a fan of the idea of a villain's land. That's also rumored to go into the rivers of America and no official announcements or anything yet that I'm aware of. I love cars. I got a piston cup trophy back here. Cars land out in California at California Adventure. It is a masterpiece. It is fantastic. That's not what they're doing here. This is something new. It's something different. It's, uh, I don't think it's just me, but uh, animated anthropomorphic cars set in the 21st century, set in the middle of 19th century American history just doesn't seem to make sense. Why not put a Cars Land back where uh, the Cars Lightning McQueen Training Academy is right now, although I think that just closed or is about to close, but uh, you'd put that in the back corner of Hollywood Studios at the end of Sunset Boulevard where there's already a Route 66 sign. The castle parks, Disneyland, Magic Kingdom, Tokyo Disneyland, etc. They aren't just random areas that are thrown in because that was popular back in 1955. The foot of Main Street about where you're sitting is the plaza. The plaza, or the hub, is the heart of Disneyland. Shooting out from here, like the four cardinal points of the compass. Remember, when you enter the park and you go underneath that little plaque that states, here you leave today and enter a world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy, those are all opposites. They're intentionally put there to balance each other out. Let me show you on the map. You have Main Street USA, you have Fantasyland, you have Tomorrowland, you have Adventureland, and you have Liberty Square and Frontierland. On the opposite end of the park from each of the lands is an area that is also opposite from it thematically. In Main Street USA, you have a romanticized version of small town America that was inspired by Walt Disney's hometown of Marceline, Missouri. Opposite that, beyond the castle, you have Fantasyland, a world of fantasy. If you head to the right, you head into Tomorrowland through wide, broad walkways, a city of the future. On the other side, narrow winding paths through jungles and the wilderness. Tomorrowland, of course, also represents tomorrow. It represents the future. Opposite it, on the other side of the park, is Liberty Square and Frontierland. Let me bring up the map again. Each of the lands is balanced thematically by a land on the other side of the park. Main Street USA, representing the real world, is balanced out by Fantasyland. The city of the future of Tomorrowland is balanced by the narrow winding pathways of Adventureland. Tomorrowland also represents the future and is balanced out on the other side of the park by Liberty Square and Frontierland. It's a pretty unique layout and it's similar in all of the castle parks around the world, all the Disney castle parks, Animal Kingdom here at Walt Disney World also has a similar kind of a balance, but between real animals and mythological animals, modern living animals and extinct animals, of course, you know, they're in the process of destroying that park as well. The layout of Magic Kingdom is unique among the castle parks. Yes, there's a frontier land, but there's that Liberty Square as well. No other Disney park has a Liberty Square. Liberty Square and Frontierland is almost like one super land. They are connected with a common theme of American history. Liberty Square, as described on the plaque as you enter the land from the hub, 
represents the earliest years of the American Republic during the colonial era, through the American Revolution, into the early 1800s. The time frame of Liberty Square is of course established on the plaque when you come into Liberty Square talking about the colonial period, as well as on the side of the Hall of Presidents is 1787. That's the year the US Constitution was ratified. The flags in Liberty Square, there's a 13 starred flag in front of the Hall of Presidents and a 13 striped 13 starred flag by the Liberty Bell, the, the Bell Bell uh, there in Liberty Square as well. The riverboat landing, the flag on the landing has 31 stars, which was the official US flag between 1851 and 1858 prior to the Civil War. I think this is pretty cool. On the boat itself, that's not a 31 starred flag, that's a 35 starred flag. It was the official flag of the United States between 1863 and 1865. When you head on into Frontierland, you can tell the dates and the time period that that is set, again, based on those buildings and dates that are on there. Ignore Tiana's Bio Adventure for just a minute because uh, that really doesn't fit Frontierland at all. If you look at the rest of it, the latest building, the latest date on any of the buildings is Grizzly Hall, where the Country Bear Musical Jamboree is. That's 1898. And then if you look at the flags in Frontierland, you'll find 35 and 37 starred flags representing the time period there in the late 1800s. And just a quick aside, I know what some of you are thinking because you've been told this, they're not real flags, they're not official flags, so they don't have to follow the flag code. Uh, that's a myth, that's not true. They represent and establish the time period that they are placed in. So this is where it gets kind of cool. When you look at the layout of the land and the time frame that is set up, it is a timeline of American history and of American geography. If you look at a US map and you lay that over this, you are going from the East Coast and the colonial era, the American Revolution, the early days of the American Republic, up until about the Civil War, and then into frontier land and west of the Mississippi, you get into the 1800s from the 1860s through to 1898. Again, we're ignoring Tiana's bio adventure because that simply does not fit. Splash Mountain certainly fit very well in Frontierland, and there is a popular opinion that no, it did not fit in Frontierland because the movie Song of the South takes place in Georgia. Yes, the movie Song of the South does take place in Georgia. And the stories that were in that film that the ride Splash Mountain was based on, uh, they were stories within the story. They could take place anywhere. The original Br'er Rabbit stories actually come from Africa and they were brought over to the United States with the slave trade. I did a whole video on this. I visited the uh, Uncle Remus Museum up in Georgia. You should watch that if you are interested in the more in-depth history of that attraction and those characters in that movie. Uh, but I digress. If you head on into Pecos Bill's Tall Tale Inn and Cafe, uh, you will find that that restaurant is themed to American folk heroes and folk tales. Behind the gates of Frontierland is the inspirational America of the past century. Here is the treasure of our native folklore. The songs, tales, and legends of the big men who built the land. There are real heroes like Kit Carson, Calamity Jane, or even Johnny Appleseed, he was a real guy. But there's also folk tales and folk heroes like Pecos Bill, Paul Bunyan, and John Henry, among others. These were all individuals and stories that were popular in the 1800s where Frontierland is set. Then across the way where Tiana's Bayou Adventure is now, you had Splash Mountain, representing the Br'er Rabbit yes, stories. But please don't fling me in that briar patch. Now look here, you keep out there, say now your business. That were published in the late 1800s by Joel Chandler Harris and represent African American folklore and history. Then when you head out to Tom Sawyer Island, you have an area that is 
themed to the works of Mark Twain, particularly The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Stories that were published and became popular, again, in the late 1800s, around the time frame that Frontierland is set. Mark Twain was the pen name for Samuel Clemens, who also authored a book called Life on the Mississippi, where he chronicled his actual training as a riverboat pilot. Welcome aboard the Liberty Bell. I'm your captain, Horace Bixby, and my pilot with me here on the Texas deck is a young cub that goes by the name of Sam Clemens. Horace Bixby was a real guy that actually trained Sam Clemens, Mark Twain, how to be a riverboat pilot just prior to the Civil War. Those are the two primary narrators on the Liberty Bell. He's marking his 100th voyage down the river today with nary a calamity on his watch uh, so far. Uh, Sam knows this river like his own backyard. Uh, Sam, tell our guest everything you know about this river. I love this river more than anything else. I've loved this river even from the time I was a toddler back in Missouri. Another neat little nod to history in the theming of the rivers of America. I mentioned earlier the flags on the riverboat landing on the riverboat itself and out at Fort Langhorne out on uh, Tom's Roar Island. Uh, it represents a time period just prior to and shortly after the American Civil War that is neatly right in between the time period established in Liberty Square and the time period of Frontierland. It connects the two, thematically, chronologically, and by geography. In the early 1970s, the Rivers of America was a much busier place. There were two keel boats, two river boats, four Tom Sawyer Island rafts, and up to 12 canoes all on the river at the same time. The Rivers of America, the Liberty Square Riverboat, and Tom Sawyer Island are greater than the sum of their two parts. When building Magic Kingdom, unlike Disneyland, they no longer had Walt Disney guiding the process, but they still had the foundation that he had laid for them. They had time, money, experience, and a whole lot of land. 27,400 acres. That is 43 square miles, twice the size of the island of Manhattan. Here in Florida, we have something special we never enjoyed at Disneyland, the blessing of size. There's enough land here to hold all the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. There is a lot of land available for all kinds of very cool ideas, fun ideas that would greatly add to the guest experience at Walt Disney World at Magic Kingdom that doesn't require you ripping out the rivers of America. When they removed Mr. Toad's wild ride and replaced it with the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, it didn't fundamentally change Fantasyland. Removing the rivers of America, well, that fundamentally changes not just Frontierland, but Liberty Square and the entire park as well. I've talked about the experience of riding the Liberty Bell Riverboat around the rivers of America and of going out to Tom Sawyer Island and how the theming of Liberty Square and Frontierland, including the rivers of America, are part of the theming of the entire park. Another aspect that I have not touched on yet is just the aesthetics of it, the beauty, the open spaces provided by those open waterways. You find them in Magic Kingdom and all of the other parks at Walt Disney World. Open areas provided by bodies of water like the Rivers of America provide vistas, sight lines to those weenies that I talked about at the beginning of the video. You see an attraction off in the distance and you want to go to it, you want to ride it. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, the Haunted Mansion, or even Tiana's Bayou Adventure. There are practical reasons for waterways as well. Lakes, ponds, streams. Waterways are all interconnected. For example, the rivers of America. Uh, when you're heading past Big Thunder Mountain Railroad there and you see the Walt Disney World Railroad Bridge, uh, that's a swing bridge. That'll open up and the riverboat can get through there. There's a canal that connects that to Seven Seas Lagoon another artificial man-made body of water. That in turn connects to Bay Lake, a natural body of water, which 
connects to the Bonnet Creek that goes right by Fort Wilderness Campground. And from there, it makes its way all the way down through Southern Florida and the Everglades and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. It rains quite a bit here in Florida. Every day during the summer, you'll get a thunderstorm, occasionally a tropical storm, and sometimes a hurricane. The Walt Disney Company has already filed for construction permits for their Rivers of America Cars project. You can see the colored in areas on the map are the areas that are affected by that permit request. The state of Florida, specifically the South Florida Water Management District, which is under the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, has requested additional information from the Walt Disney Company, basically amounting to, as I understand it, an environmental impact statement, what will happen to all of the wildlife and plants that are in the area, as well as water management issues. It's still October as I'm recording this, and so the Disney Company does have time to comply with that request from the state. If they don't comply, uh, no permit, if they do comply, but they don't answer the questions to the satisfaction of the state, no permit. Uh, but if they do, then the project will move forward. Uh, we'll see what happens. I hope you liked my video. It was kind of a long one, but you made it through to the end. I promise we are very near to the end. Uh, hit the like button if you haven't already. Hit the subscribe button to my channel. And if you want to share it on the social medias, that'd be great. I don't think I've ever had a video, made a video that I wanted to go viral more than I want this one to go viral. I hope the Rivers of America can be saved. Tom Sawyer Island, the Liberty Square Riverboat. But I think we may be looking at a fond farewell in the not too distant future.